Welcome to my promised Q&A session. Uh, now we're going to resume regular scheduled programming in two weeks time, uh, but for now this was a video that I thought I'd get out of the way and answer everyone's questions that they had following my return. Now because of the sheer amount of demand for information regarding the aero courses, I've actually split this video into two segments. So the first half I'm going to be doing the normal sort of general question and answers, and then for the second half I'm going to be addressing all the questions that were specifically related to the courses that I was talking about potentially doing. So anyway, let's start with the general Q&A. So the first question up is, what didn't you like about the lifestyle and what made you want to come back? The issue with the lifestyle was very much a, a multi-part thing. It wasn't just a single issue. To give you some context to the problem, I grew up in Sydney, which is a really nice place, super close living to to beaches, mountain bikes, hiking, stuff like that, um, and tons of stuff to do really easy to get into the city. It was a really great place to live. I then moved over to Brackley, which is in basically the middle of nowhere in the center of the UK. Really hard to get to doing anything. There's not much around there to do. The weather's a little bit miserable. Um, the sunlight is up for too long in summer and not up for long enough in winter. Um, and generally, it's not a great place to live. On the work side of things, I generally speaking enjoy my job at Mercedes. I like intensity in my work, I like a little bit of pressure, um, so I quite enjoyed that aspect. But the thing was that the hours were still fairly long, um, so we had fairly lengthy hours. Um, not as crazy as some other teams that I've heard about, but still longer than a regular day job. Um, and then on top of that, you do have a decent amount of pressure and, and the work just sort of starts to consume your life a little bit. Um, Overall, what I was finding was that while I was really enjoying my work, uh, my life away from work kind of was just being reduced to nothing and I was all getting focused and consumed on my work, which was sort of fun, but also uh, probably not really healthy for me in the long term. So what I had on one side was a job that I, I really quite liked. Um, and then on the other side, I had a, a lifestyle away from my job, which I didn't like at all. Um, I didn't have a lot of free time. I didn't have a lot of free money. Um, and so in general, it, it just wasn't working out for me very well. So I, I was fighting this war of attrition between my life outside of work and, and my work. And in the end, um, I reached the two year sort of mark and decided that that, that wasn't the balance that was right for me. Um, and so I handed in my notice uh, and I came back to Sydney. From what I've been feeling since I've gotten back to Australia, it feels like I made the right decision for both myself and, and also the happiness of my wife who wasn't really loving it over there either. Next question up, and this is obviously a, a very popular one, uh, is what did Kyle do at Merck? Like I say, I really cannot say very much about what I did. It's pretty tight in terms of the confidentiality around what I was working on and what I did. Um, what I can say is that I was an aerodynamicist working in the aerodynamics department. In terms of what that means, it means I was one of the guys that designed all those tiny little winglets uh, that you see all over the car, all those little bits and pieces everywhere, um, and design the sort of shape of the aero pieces. In terms of what I actually did there, uh, I managed to put quite a decent amount of performance on the car across quite a few car years uh, with my own designs, uh, and I'm very proud of that, obviously. Uh, but apart from that, I can't really discuss a whole lot more, so I'm afraid I'm just going to have to leave you with that. How did I get my job in F1? Uh, well, this is, this is quite a funny one, because I, I had contacts at quite a few F1 teams, uh, but I didn't have any contacts at Mercedes. Uh, so I saw an ad go up for a job uh, as an aerodynamicist at Mercedes. Uh, I applied for it, had some interviews and got it. it pretty much just straightforward like that. Um, there's not really much more to say, except it surprised me how I got it. And apparently you can apply for jobs in F1 teams and get them. So that's pretty cool. So we've got a question here about how do you get so knowledgeable in engineering and then how do you apply that to sort of getting a job in motorsport? So I think the crux of these questions is what did I do to get into motorsports and in F1 in particular, what was my career path? So back in high school, I started to really get into engineering. I was doing a lot of engineering related activities, working on a lot of just regular road cars and stuff like that. Um, from there, I went to university did a Bachelor of Engineering in Aerospace. Uh, I was also doing Formula Student uh, or Formula SAE at the same time as that. Uh, I managed to rise up to Technical Director in that, so I got a real wealth of experience from that. And in the university side of things, I also graduated 
with the university medal, which means uh, top of class in engineering. To get there, I obviously had to put in a lot of work, a lot of hard work to get to that point. And by putting in all that work and ignoring a lot of distractions on the side, I was able to increase my knowledge base significantly and get a really wide base of knowledge across a number of engineering fields. After my university, I took a one year break uh, to work on the design and construction of my own off-road race car because I really wanted a race car and I really wanted to practice and learn my skills and develop them. So I took that one year break. Uh, at the end of the year, I decided to start a PhD in aerodynamics because I thought that would be a good route into Formula One. So I started that PhD at the same time as I was doing that, I was also A, running the YouTube channel, B, still building the buggy, and C, I was doing a lot of consulting work. Uh, so I was doing consulting work for a whole bunch of different things. I started branching out into aerodynamic consulting for race cars, just starting out doing it on the cheap, and then slowly ramped it up to where I was doing it more and more and more. Uh, and I got to design a lot of different cars that I got to experience a lot of different processes. I got to take that aerodynamics knowledge from my PhD and turn it practical. Uh, so basically all these different facets of my life were really engineering based and a really broad spread uh, of the engineering spectrum. Of course, by the end of my PhD, I'd now designed CFD area kits for maybe 15 to 20 cars at that point. By the time I got out of the PhD and got on the phone to Merck for an interview, I knew pretty well what I was talking about. So from that aspect, I was able to then successfully nail that interview and then I got into F1. And that was more or less how it went. Um, so. To simplify the question, following a passion, focusing on that passion, but also all the different facets of it in terms of engineering and working really hard. Uh, they're the main things that, that got me to where I am today. So we've got a multi-part question here. We've got, did the job live up to expectations? What was the work environment like? And were there any perks? So first part, yes, the job lived up to expectations. It was pretty much exactly as I thought it would be. So not too much to comment there, it was expectations. Um, in terms of the work environment, I think overall it's a pretty positive work environment. Uh, at Mercedes, you obviously have a lot of uh, quite skilled people uh, really focused on trying to, to win because obviously everyone there likes winning. Um, and that's really good environment. Everyone's pretty friendly, everyone gets on pretty well. Um, and you're all pushing towards a common goal, which is really nice. So the, the work environment was pretty good. I, I was pretty happy with that. In terms of perks, there were quite a few cool perks of the jobs. I can't share all of them, uh, but probably some of the coolest highlights for me was I got to do a practice pit stop, uh, which was a lot of fun and really exhilarating. Uh, I got to be both a uh, wheel gun man and wheel off for, for quite a few pit stops. So that, that was a lot of fun. Um, and another one that was really cool was I got to go around and tour all the different departments and see what they were doing and all the different things that were going on there. So that, that was really sweet. Uh, it, it was a really cool experience. There was a lot of other stuff too, uh, but I'm not really going to comment on that because I probably shouldn't be talking about it. Regarding the what does my typical day look like, uh, can't really comment on the specifics of that, uh, but generally speaking, it, it had a decent intensity and a decent pressure. Uh, and I quite like that. that. That's really my style. I like a decent amount of intensity. Uh, obviously, if you don't like intensity, you probably shouldn't be in the top tier of motorsport. But yeah, I, I quite enjoyed that. So another two-parter. Uh, did I enjoy the Merc Christmas parties? And what happened with my buggy while I was away? Uh, Merc Christmas parties were off the hook. They are unfortunately social media blackouted, so I cannot share a single thing about them. But they were pretty damn awesome. Um, F1 teams know how to throw a party. In terms of what happened to my buggy, I basically put it into hibernation mode before I left and it's been sitting in my parents' shed the entire time I've been away. Um, so now that I'm back, unfortunately there's no racing at the moment because of COVID, uh, but my plan is when I get some free time to bring it out of hibernation, uh, get it set up properly because I was never really happy with how the suspension was set up. Um, and then hopefully it will be ready to race in time for next year's racing season or, or whenever we can have a racing season. You made a video a few years ago comparing electric to, to internal combustion engines. Uh, what's your opinion now? Uh, I mean, to be honest with you, I think the results have largely spoken for themselves. Um, I spoke about in that video how electric had a lot of advantages. It just had to do a little bit of catch up in terms of the battery and the storage density. Uh, and I think in reality, we've seen a bit of that coming into play already. Since I made that video, we had the IDR uh, come out and that obviously completely smashed Pikes Peak. Um, 
and smash Goodwood, things like that. Uh, I think there will always be a bit of a debate as to whether it would have been faster or something like a hybrid system or something like that. Uh, but I think it's pretty obvious that they are catching. They're probably still not there yet. Um, well, I mean, they're definitely not there yet, but they will catch, it will happen. It's just a matter of when. And to be honest with you, I don't know that. I can't really predict that. I think the next five to 10 years is gonna be very interesting to watch. Please do a video about the T50's aerodynamics. So for this one, I am planning on doing a video. Uh, I just need to work out first how to not offend Gordon Murray. Because I really like Gordon Murray. I like a lot of his designs. Um, and I just want to make sure that my feedback is received in a positive way uh, and doesn't result in negative consequences. Okay, courses subsection. So I had a lot of people ask questions about the courses. I had 48 people, I think, was what I counted. Um, I encourage anyone who hasn't already and is interested in the courses to go to the JKF Aero website, click on the courses link in the top bar and then register your email. So that way when the courses do come out, uh, I can go and send you out a bulk email and you'll know when they're there because I'm planning on doing an introductory price offer where the intro price is lower and then it will ramp up. Um, so make sure you register there so that I can hook you up. Um, but let's start on some of the questions that people are asking. Will your course be online or in person only? Uh, it will be online. Uh, I wasn't planning on doing it in person. Uh, I think it's easier to reach more people this way. And I also think in the context of the current global situation, it makes a lot more sense to do it online. So yes, it will be an online course. It will not be in person. When would the course be available? To be honest with you, I've started working on it now. It's taking longer than I thought it would, um, mainly because I'm trying to keep the production quality a bit higher than the YouTube videos. Um, it's proving to take quite a bit of time. Um, so I'm anticipating you're not gonna see it before two months, could be a bit longer. So we'll see what happens there. Now, lots of questions here on the course pricing. Uh, I saw a lot of interest is around the sort of 100 to 150 US dollar mark. Uh, to be honest with you, that's probably a little bit lower than what I'm aiming for. Um, my initial thoughts before I got feedback from everyone in terms of the sort of effort I was gonna put in and how big I thought the market was, was that I actually wanted to price around the 1,000 to 1,100. US dollar mark, um, please leave feedback on that if that is an issue for you and would turn you off. Um, the other option is I could bring it down to the sort of 300 to 400 US dollar mark, but I, I really do need the volume to make it worth my while because it's, it's a big investment, not only in time to, of producing the videos, uh, but also in terms of obviously I've spent a lot of years building up that knowledge and for me to give that knowledge away it has to come at a, enough of a benefit to me that it's not gonna offset anything else. Um, so from that perspective, uh, it does need to be a little bit higher than say something like a high performance academy course, uh, cause obviously they have a huge amount of volume uh, that can compensate for that. Whereas realistically the people that are interested in engine tuning are far greater in number than those interested in aerodynamics tuning. Um, and I think that the course pricing needs to reflect that. How do I pay for your aero course? And do I accept Walmart gift cards or Bitcoin? Uh, no, I do not, uh, perhaps as you would guessed. Um, in terms of paying for the course, uh, once the course is online, it will just be all through a web portal. You'll pay there um, and then it will unlock the course and you'll be able to just go through it. So it's gonna be pretty sweet and pretty easy to go through. Would you run a proper course on how to use OpenFoam and PowerView properly from absolute beginner all the way to advanced as can be, simulating parts and assemblies on your own? Um, this one's a tricky one. Uh, foam, probably not, just because um, if I showed you how to use foam perfectly, I would end up showing my CFD settings off that I use for consulting and I don't wanna show those off uh, because obviously my competitors uh, could just buy the course steal my settings and that's that. Um, so probably not for foam. Uh, for PowerView, yes, I was planning on doing a, a secondary course on uh, post-processing of CFD results. Um, more than happy to do that. Um, that won't be the prime course, that will be another course. I think it's a good idea and I'm not afraid to show you guys how to use PowerView well. So I've got a question here on the courses, whether they'll just be for beginners or there'll be an advanced one too. Uh, with the courses, uh, there's gonna be more than one course eventually. Uh, I think if there's interest in the course and demand is high and we're getting good throughput, I, I'm definitely keen to, to do the courses more of things. So basically we'll have the YouTube channel, which will be sort of general stuff, more general knowledge, 
uh, that's not going to go away. I have every intent to keep that going. Um, and then you'd have the courses as well, uh, which are that really specialized knowledge, uh, starting up with, with fundamental kits. So I'm, I'm talking about doing like a, a definitive course of race car aerodynamics would be one course. Uh, and then we'll have sort of uh, more complex add-ons for the advanced courses. Now, obviously that's not gonna all release at once, uh, but it is my intent to, to bring that to you guys, uh, especially if the demand is there. That's all from this Q&A. Thanks for watching. If you like this style of video and would like to see me do more of these, please let me know in the comments. Uh, also, don't forget to hit that like button and subscribe to my channel for more like this. Uh, thanks for watching and hopefully I'll see you next time.